Well, it's our 51st uh, anniversary since the church, the Pentecostal church started in Congleton, so we're celebrating that this weekend, and we've brought in a very special speaker all the way from Newark. His name is John Harris. I was expecting all this front road to suddenly go wild when I said Newark and John Harris. They let me down. (laughs) We'll just rewind and do that again. So it's very good to have a special speaker all the way from Newark. That's what I was expecting. (laughs) His name's John Harris. Okay, stop now because we're not getting through the rest of the night. (laughs) Um, John is um, the MD of a company called JHCS, which means John Harris Computer Specialist. Very special, and so uh, that's his company, and um, they write programs and make software and do websites and all stuff like that, so um, that's what John does for his sort of day job, but he's got a real passion to talk to people about creation, and very often people tell us, oh, science disproves the Bible. Well, John is really making it his mission in life to show that science proves the Bible, and particularly in the area of uh, creation. So that's what he's going to be talking about tonight. He's brought his family with him tonight, his wife Danny and their three children. Um, The reason I've got to know them very well is because one of their children called Peter is going to be marrying my daughter next year. So uh, we've got to know them quite well. (laughs) So... um, They'll be here again next year, probably even more rowdily at the wedding than they are tonight. But <laughs> we're looking forward to that. So the way that things are going to go tonight um, is I'm going to hand over to John very, very shortly. He's going to do us a presentation that will last around about three quarters of an hour. Then we're going to have a little break for some tea and coffee and light refreshments. And then another three quarters of an hour presentation. Now, if you have any questions, this is a questions box. Sorry that it's got a pink lid on, but boys, you'll just have to get over that. (laughs) Um, So that's going to be left out in the entrance area. And John will have a, if you want to write a question and stick it in that box, then John will have a look at that and may be able to deal with some of them in the second session. But tomorrow morning, um, particularly, John is going to be trying to answer as many questions as go in this box as possible. So he'll do what he can tonight, but obviously we have time constraints, which is why I'm going to shut up now (laughs) and hand over to John. So let's give him a really big warm welcome for John Harris. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Thank you for coming. I am very, very privileged to be here today to talk on a, uh, on a subject of creation, evolution, a subject I've got a great deal of passion in, absolutely loads. I've been told, apparently, you had a very famous speaker called Ken Ham who came to your town a couple of years ago. I just wondered how many people came to that talk? Okay, that's a good. Not much competition, good. And uh, <laughs> how many didn't? Okay, that's odd. Some of you didn't raise your hand, so either one of the... How many are confused about the question so far? Okay, we're all doing fine. Um, (laughs) Now, (laughs) okay, um, I'm told because some of you are apparently familiar with this subject to make sure that uh, I'm very advanced in, in my discussion, and also apparently some of you are not very familiar, so I'm supposed to be also very simple at the same time. So I'm hoping that I won't disappoint all of you today. Right, just so that you know, um... My name is John Harris. I am Lebanese. I've come all the way from Lebanon to be here today. Uh, (laughs) Okay, I've been here for over 25 years now. Uh, It's a great place to be. Um, I just wonder how many people are from Congleton here? Show of hands, Congleton. And all right. And how many from Newark? Okay, you're slightly outnumbered. And, (laughs) And how many who come from different places? 
other than Congleton and Newark. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, uh, I'm sure uh, none of you came from as far as Newark, which is nearly 100 miles from here. Right, um, just, <laughs> just so that you know, for some people, depending on how you drive to get here. Um, right, so that you know, I lived between the age of 7 and 17. I was brought up in Lebanon between the age of 7 and 17. I lived uh, in the middle of civil war. It was me dodging bullets, bombs, and snipers. That was great fun. Not, high, not recommended at all. I'm going to be sharing more about this tomorrow night, so I hope you can make it for tomorrow night. Um, so I had a pretty much a rough upbringing. But uh, I used to love science, and I wanted to read about science all the time. I spent all my time reading my book, science book. Uh, books. I had many, and when I ran out, I used to use my sister's science books, and she's three years ahead of me. It was absolutely fantastic. I used to do loads of experiments, and you have to understand, in Lebanon, the environment is such that you can use things like gunpowder to do experiments. Uh, I stopped doing that now. I, I don't do that anymore. I haven't done it for weeks. Um, <laughs> I have, uh, I'm running my own business, uh, I'm the MD of my own business, I've been running a business for 15 years, uh, as been mentioned by Andrew, and basically I write software programs, I write in many different languages, I write them in COBOL, Clipper, Machine Code, Assembler, Basic, HTML, JavaScript, and so on. Well, if, if none of this makes any sense to you, it doesn't matter, it's not important for today, I'm, I'm just showing off, so bear with me. Um, I am... Um, I have been doing this for a couple of years, and I have been, I put together a course called Discovery Night that's suitable for churches, suitable for schools. So if anybody's interested in the subject, talk to me later. Basically, the subject talks about the truths in the Bible, and also what evidence there is, if any, that supports evolution theory. People want to know the facts, and they want to know where it all comes and put, it's put together. So today, I'm going to assume that you know absolutely very little about this subject. So I'm going to start right from the beginning to make it very easy for people to follow. So, here, and uh, two hours, unfortunately, or two sessions of 45 minutes doesn't do the subject any justice. So, if you need to know a little bit more about any particular subject, we'll have to talk. I'll have to come back again and cover those. Okay, let's start. Uh, there are two, basically, two worldviews about how the universe started and how life started, okay? It's either that God did it, that means there is a creator, or that means uh, intelligent uh, design, or that uh, it was by evolution, self-created, uh, it's purely by chance, and basically we are God under, that, under those circumstances. Okay, of course there are those who have uh, on the fringe of lunacy, and they believe that we're not really here, we think we are, this is not reality, we're going to discount those for today, because um, basically there are two opposing views, it's either creation or evolution. Okay, of course, there are going to be some people today who are going to say, of course, we came from aliens. Okay, now, <laughs> you're probably right. I don't believe in it, but you <laughs> some people do look like they're aliens. But, um, in fact, I think I recognize those faces. I think they could be with us today. So, if your picture is up there, can you just stand up? Can you just stand up if your picture is up there? I'm sure I've seen you guys. Oh, there you go. Just turn around so people can look like what you normally look like. This is, <laughs> this is what they normally look like. That's my daughter, and that's my niece. I actually, they did not pose for this picture. I actually found them by accident and put it up there to surprise them. And uh, this is what they look like when they wake up in the morning. All right. <laughs> um, like a Russian atheist astronomer once said, he said, either there is a God or there isn't. You see, these Russian uh, astronomers are very clever like that. But then he said something very profound. He said, both possibilities are frightening. And that is indeed true. Now, there's a well-known creationist who once said, if there is no God, the Earth is rotating around the sun at 66,000 miles per hour, and no one is in charge. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, I hold the view, without apology, the creationist worldview, that the world is too complex to had, that it had to be created by an all-wise, all-powerful creator who is outside of and beyond and above and not affected by his creation. And it's also my studied opinion that the Bible is the infallible, inspired, inerrant word of the living God. So you know where I stand with this, uh, in this view. Right, the original creation was perfect and much different than it is today. Okay, the original creation, plants and animals lived longer and grew larger than they do today. Okay, now the Bible says, in the beginning, 
God. That means that's where everything starts. The Bible tells us in Genesis that God made everything within six days. That means 6,000 years ago, He created everything. 4,400 4, years ago, the flood. And then 2,000 years ago, the birth of Jesus. And here we are today. So that's creation 6,000 years ago. The global flood 4,400 years ago. 2,000 years ago, Jesus. And here we are today. Now, the evolutionists say... In the beginning was dirt or slime. Okay, so that's 20 billion years ago. That's the Big Bang. That's how it started, according to the evolutionists. 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth forms. 3.5 billion years ago, life starts. Three, three billion years ago, according to the chart there. Life starts, and here we are today. So obviously, these two charts are not to scale, because if they were to scale, the bottom one would be three million times larger. Okay, that's a lot larger. So that's about one and a half meters wide. So that means if we made the bottom one to the scale of the top one, it would be 2,800 miles long. Now that is as far as from here to Canada. All right, I measured this properly. Uh, can you see it from where you are? This is from here to Canada. I don't think that Andrew would ever want to buy a screen that large. Okay, it will make my talk a lot easier but I don't think you would really want to do this. So these are worlds apart, okay? These two theories are worlds apart. They are not compatible, and they don't work with each other, all right? They are opposing views. Okay, back to the Bible. How do we know the Bible is, how do we know creation is 6,000 years old? How do we know this? Well, we figure this out from the generations mentioned in the Bible. For example, the Bible says that Adam was 130 when he had Seth, and Seth was 105 when he had Enos, and Enos was 90 when he had Canaan, and so on. So if you put them all together, we get roughly about 4,000 BC. That's 6,000 years ago. Okay? The first person, or one of the people who actually did the number crunching on this, is a guy called James Usher. He lived in the 17th century, and he worked it out as accurately as you can possibly do these things. There are a lot of uh, space for errors but roughly about 4,400 B.C. I'm sure he wasn't that accurate, but we're saying the Bible says the world is 6,000 years old versus the evolutionists who say 20 billion years old or billions of years, all right? So the views are, I, I want to make very clear where the views stand on this. Right. Okay, so what happened during the flood? About 4,400 years ago, there was a global flood, not a local one, okay? A global flood that covered the whole earth. And during this flood, everyone dies except for Noah, his children, and their wives, and all the animals that were in the ark, okay? Now, people, plants, and animals outside the ark all died and got buried, all right? So they got buried, and what happened is that the, the waters were rushing back and forth, and the Bible refers to this as assuage. That means it dropped the land, the crust of the earth dropped, the water rushed down. That's where the water came down from the um, subterranean uh, under the crust. It came out, the crust collapsed, and all the water went back in again, or receded back into their uh, areas where they dropped. Okay, now they caused something, the, as the waters were going back and forth, they caused something, it caused a principle called hydrologic sorting. Now, hydrologic sorting is the principle of, if you had a, uh, a jar of water and you put some sand in it, and you shake it really well, and then you let it settle, it will produce layers for you. Okay, that's called hydrologic sorting. The water is capable of sorting those sand or, or rubble or whatever dirt you've got in this uh, jar into layers. Okay, so what happened during the flood is that you had animals trapped within those layers. That's the evolution, that's the creationist worldview. That's how it all happened. And this happened over just about a year. You see, when the flood occurred, it wasn't just 40 days and 40 night, nights. What happened is that it was extended over the whole year period. Okay, there was a whole year period where Noah was on the ark waiting for the water to settle down so he can come out. During that time is when all of this took place. After the year's period, uh, Noah came out of the ark and he basically um, had to repopulate the world along with his children, and the animals that were in the ark. Now, that is how we get things called petrified um, plants and fossils. Okay, that's why we get coal. Uh, that's how we get natural gases. Oil and natural gases, for example, comes from fish and reptiles and animals uh, buried under heat and pressure conditions. 
Okay, let me give you a quick explanation about what fossilization is and petrification. Uh, if I, I thought if I get a few terminologies right before we start, I haven't even started yet. So I'm just going to go through a few things here. This subject is so complicated. If you don't get the basis right, you can't follow later on what's coming on. Right, fossilization is when you have a trace uh, of a, uh, or a part of a body in a fossil, in a stone, in a rock, or even ice, if you've got a trace of it. And usually you get the outline of it. All right, that's what happens when you have fossilization. And, it's, and you can even have footprints or fingerprints. And of course, you need water and sediments because you're doing replacement of minerals. So you need water and you need sediments for this. Now, petrification is when a fossil turns into stone. All right, so that's quite easy. It happens because, again, you trap it, water goes into, um, when you get a fossil buried, you get mineral replacement. And generally, to get petrification, you need to uh, replace it with quartz minerals, or pyrite, as they call it. Scientists don't always use these terminologies correctly. Normally, they say fossilization when they mean petrification. All right, so don't be confused about this. Petrification is when it turns into stone. Fossilization is supposed to be like an, a, an imprint. But they use those words, they interchange between them, and you're supposed to guess what they mean. And you can fossilize and petrify just about anything, even material like this teddy bear that you can see up there. So you need water, you need sediments, you need mineral replacements, and that's how it happens. Okay, now, here's the thing. Surprisingly, not many people know what is meant when people talk about evolution. What is meant? Most people think that evolution basically means a variation within a kind. Okay, so when somebody says something has evolved, you think they're talking about a variation within one kind of animal. But when TV programs are telling you about evolution, when museums are advertising this, they are not talking about the same thing. They're telling you, they're trying to tell you that an animal can change from one kind to something else completely. Okay, like um, uh, we talk about evolution, we talk about a, a different variety of dogs, big dog, small dog, black dog, white dog, clever dog, stupid dog, hot dog, something like that. Of course, not hot dog, but they're talking about a dog producing something other than a dog, like a cat, okay? Now, there's a big difference between dogs and cats. If you can't tell the difference, you need to tell somebody, someone professional, ideally. Okay, now, it's, going, it's further than that. It's actually worse than that. It's, uh, they're trying to tell you that you, we are all related. Everything is related. We are even related to plants. Let me just uh, read this for you, Charles Darwin. This is what he said. It's truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. So what he's saying is that all plants and animals are related to each other. That's what he's suggesting, isn't he? He's saying that a flower and a donkey are actually related to each other. If you tell your, your parents come from, or your ancestors come from a vegetable, that's considered an insult. It really is. So apparently here it's science. Okay. Right, um, this is not a scientific fact. We don't have any proof for it. And this statement is made everywhere. This is the kind of statement you see in textbooks. You see it uh, creeping up on you absolutely everywhere. You see, evolutionists and creationists are looking at the same thing. They're coming up with different conclusions. Let me, uh, I remember when I was 15, uh, when I was young, and I was um, going to school. I even remember which school this was in. A friend came to me. He knew that I loved science a lot. So he came to me and said, John, I'm going to tell you this story. There is, uh, they, they've done a scientific experiment I'm going to tell you about. And I thought, that's amazing. I love all these things. So off you go. So he was telling me, John, look, scientists got together and got a grasshopper. Okay, they got this grasshopper, you know how grasshoppers got two legs and it jumps really far. So he got a grasshopper and they told the grasshopper to jump. Hop grasshopper, they told it and off it went hopping. It hopped beauty beautifully. They brought the grasshopper back, put it back on the bench and took one leg off. And they told the grasshopper to hop, hop grasshopper. And lo and behold, it hopped again with one leg. It didn't hop as far, but it certainly did hop. Then they brought it back. They took the last leg off, they pulled it out. You have to understand, in Lebanon, this was well before animal rights, okay? And people, people really didn't care about human beings, so it didn't really matter if they took these things off these legs. So they took the last leg off, put it on the bench, and they said, hop, grasshopper. And of course, it didn't move. So they said, hop, grasshopper, hop, and it didn't move again. So they came to the conclusion that when you pull all the legs from a grasshopper, it goes deaf. Okay. <laughs> So, 
So this is the thing. Um, two people can look at the same evidence and come up with different conclusions. Here's an example of this. For example, evolutionists say that all the layers in places like the Grand Canyon, okay, happened over millions of years. Now, the creationists say that this happened during the global flood. All right? Two views there. Now, they, call, they, they are so convinced that these layers happened th over time, they even called them different names. They've got names for it, as you can see. And, um, and they named them after places in England where they've been digging and found them. That's what they did. Now, if you could find them, the only place you can find this, uh, this geologic column is in textbooks, and they're in the complete set, okay? So, the, um, nowhere can you find them in reality. But if you did, in reality, they've looked around, and the average thickness is one mile when it should be between one and 200 miles thick. Okay, the average thickness across the world is one mile thick. But if they really could find them in its entirety, it should be between one and 200 miles. Okay, so they have to cheat and get them from different places and stack them on top of each other to make this work. Now, if you ask the evolutionists, they tell you they have plenty of places where these uh, layers exist. The truth is what they have is layers with fossils in the order they expect them to be. That's what they find at best. The only place you'll find the geologic column in perfect tact is in the imagination. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Now, it is true that these layers do exist, but the question is, how did they get there? Okay, how did it get there? Now, if each of these layers are of different age, shouldn't there be erosions between them? All right, shouldn't there be erosions between those layers? It should have rained once in a while, don't you think? Yeah, it should have happened. Okay, if these layers of a different age, shouldn't there be a soil between each one of those layers? This is a case of grasshopper hop, you know? So uh, they come up with the wrong conclusion. Another reason why these, they say these layers are um, not millions of years apart, but another reason we know it's not millions of years apart is because they found something called polystrata fossils that go right across the layers. You would think that those layers would actually, um, the, the fossils would actually rot away by the time millions of years went by and more layers went on top. Still, hop, grasshopper, hop. Okay, now, um, we have, I have many more examples about polystrata layers. I can't go through them today. This is, this is not about that today. I haven't even started yet. This textbook says, if there were a column of sediments, unfortunately, no such column exists. Okay, so it doesn't exist anywhere it's made up. And evolutionists need to use this in order for them to create that time and overrule the global flood. That's very important to them. So where did this idea come from? This whole idea started by a guy called Charles Lyell in 1830. And he wrote a book called Principles of Geology. Charles Lyell hated the Bible. He absolutely hated the Bible and he mocked scripture all the time. All he wanted to do is to discredit the Bible. So much for a scientific book. He hates the Bible, and every, th every statement in this book oozes hate uh, to the, for the Bible. Let me show you a few examples. Okay, Charles Lyell said in page 30, he said, They reach false conclusions, futile reasoning, ancient doctrines sanctioned by implicit faith of many generations and supposed to rest on scriptural authority. Here's a backhanded dig on the Bible. Uh, for those who dared to believe in, in the Bible. On page 41, he said, the interest of religion as well as those of sound, sound philosophy had suffered. Stop there. What is he saying here? He's saying that you can't have religion and sound philosophy. Is that what he's saying? That's what he's implying. Then he says, by perpetually mixing up the sacred writings with questions in physical science, he's trying to make it look like the Bible and science don't get along. The Bible and science get along very well. It's the Bible and evolution that don't get along at all. Next one. He reasoned philosophically against those who regarded the disordered state of the earth's crust as exhibiting signs of the earth uh, of God for the, si for the sins of man. Charles Lyell is trying to remove the idea that the flood created this uh, layers because he doesn't want to, uh, he doesn't want it to represent God's wrath on earth. You see, it, evolutionists don't want you to see the world like this, because if you did, you might be saved, because you would see something that is different, that's biblical. Okay, in, 19, uh, in page 197, he said, accusations founded on religious prejudices. Charles Lyell is saying, if you believe in the Bible, you are a prejudice. 
page 302, he said, men of superior talents, he's talking about himself, who thought for themselves and were not blinded by authority, like the Bible. Okay, another backhanded dig here. It says, if you believe in the Bible, uh, you can't think for yourself. That's what he's saying. If you believe in the Bible, you can't think for And this happens all the time. If you talk to an evolutionist and you tell them about how the Bible and creation and science fit together, you are told that you can't think for yourself. Okay? That's what happens all the time. They mock you all the time. I get that all the time when I'm doing debates on the internet. It's actually quite laughable until you know the game and you respond to that and they, you put them in their place. But they do that. They mock, it, mock you all the time on this subject. Charles Lyell said his goal is to free science from Moses. What a statement to make on a science book, to, throw me, for, for, to free science from Moses. Now, most scientists in those days were Christians, and they had no problems with the Bible and, and science. They had no problem with that, okay? Because, but he wanted to get rid of the Bible and put in millions of years instead of it, right there. So, if this book which is what people use to, to, this is how the geologic column started, this is how the layer started. When you, if you're going to school, you will see that uh, references to this book will be made again and again. If this book was about nothing but science, why did he feel he had to attack the Bible? Okay, why did he feel he had to do that? That won't make sense. That just doesn't, that, that's not how it should work, surely. His main interest was to attack the Bible. That's what he wanted to do. And it's important for you to know when we talk about geologic columns and those layers, it's come from this source. It's a direct attack on the Bible. That's what they're doing here. He wants you to look at science and find the Bible does not make sense. That's what he's trying to do. He's being very deceitful. Okay. Now, interesting enough, the Bible warns us of bad science. In 1 Timothy 6.20, it says, O Timothy, Keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. You know what? I like science. But science falsely so-called is where the evolution fits in. Okay? And the Bible has already warned us of this because it's written by God and he knows what was going to come. Okay. Science. Evolution is called science when it shouldn't be called science. You'll see in a minute why. I haven't started yet. Okay, <laughs> so the first question about the subject of creation evolution is why even ask the question, okay? What's the big deal anyway? So what if people believed in evolution? That's because evolution is not just bad science. You need to understand this. Evolution is not just bad science. It is actually a religion. It is a religion. Now, the, most people don't recognize this because most people recognize that a religion, like, for example, they know the difference between Christianity, Buddha, uh, Islam, or any kind of, kind of Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, any kind of that, you recognize it as a religion. But because evolution is under the heading of science, most people don't recognize we're dealing with a religion, uh, with religion attributes here. And it has nothing to do with science. You'll see in a minute. So here are the facts. If evolution is true, you need to hear this, if evolution is true, then the Bible is wrong. All right? There is no middle ground here. What does evolutionists say? Evolution say the world was billions of years old. Life started 3.5 billion years ago. Many deaths took place, and then came along Adam. That's what evolution says. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that it started a few thousand years ago. Adam was created, and sin came through Adam, that means death only started after Adam sinned, all right? Can you see the opposing views here? It's completely the opposite. There is no way of marrying those two together. One of them, the plot, the hero of the plot is death in order for Adam to come into the scene, and the other one is Adam came, came into the scene and sin brought death into the world. Yet we need to see the difference here. Do not try to connect them. They, they cannot be married in, in any way whatsoever. Before we go any further, because I haven't started yet, I need to get a few terminologies right here. And that's important, especially if you're discussing this subject with someone who pretends to know this subject. Okay, you need to know this subject. Okay, here's a quick summary. There are several different types of evolution. There is cosmic evolution, which means the origin of time, space, and matter. There is chemical, uh, chemical evolution. That's the origin of higher elements from hydrogen. We're going to come to that in a few seconds. Then you got stellar and planetary or, uh, um, evolution, which is the origin of stars and planets. Then you got organic evolution, which is the origin of life. Okay, then you got macroevolution. This is life forms changing from one kind 
to something completely different. Okay, dog to a cat. That's completely different. And then you got a microevolution. That's a variation within a kind. Okay, there are six meanings of evolution. Please follow this. This is important if you ever want to bring this up and discuss this. Six meanings of evolution. Now we're going to examine each one of those very briefly because one way or another today you will learn something new. Okay, we make sure of that. Okay. I can expand on any one of those subjects later on, but we're going to go as brief as I can possibly go. Right, before we start, I'll tell you when we start. Um, we're going to go with a couple of terminologies here. We're going to understand what science means, okay? According to the Webster's Dictionary, science means systemized, systemized knowledge derived from observation, study, and experimentation. Let's not get confused. That's what science means, all right? And that means it's something you observe, you test, you can demonstrate. It's very important. Okay, what does religion mean? Okay, again, according to the same dictionary, it's a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of universe. That's interesting, right? Okay, that means how did it start, why did it start, and what was it? All right, that's very important. You need to understand that. Right, we're going to start now. We're going to start with cosmic evolution. All right, cosmic evolution is the origin of time, space, and matter. The evolutionists refer to this as the Big Bang. All right? This textbook says, 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matters in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period in this page. For some unknown reason, the region exploded. The explosion is called the Big Bang. Wow, that's the Big Bang, all right? Okay, you see, that's not the only idea they came up with. They came up with the idea of the Big Bang. They came up with oscillating universe. Oscillating universe is something that it expands and then shrinks and expands and shrinks again. They call that the oscillating universe. They came up with the idea called steady state universe. That's the idea that it's self-generating. This is a universe that doesn't need any of these things. It's just self-perpetuating, self-generating. So who's right? Well, actually, none of them, if you believe in the string theory that comes along with membranes. So something tells me I don't think they know. Okay, so they've come up with all these theories because they haven't really got an idea. Okay, that's because God is not allowed to be part of the answer. Okay, so how would they ever get the right answer if God is not allowed to be part of the answer and God did it? How would that work out? They will never get there. Okay, the Big Bang was suggested by a Belgian faithful priest, bless him, and astronomer called Georges Edward, Edward Lemaitre. Okay, he's the guy who started this idea off. He called it listen to this, the cosmic egg exploding at the moment of creation. That's his title for what he think happened, okay? In 1927, Lemaitre said the universe is few light years in diameter. That's about 12 trillion miles. That's what he said in 1927. In 65, reduced to 275 miles. In 72, he reduced that to 71 miles. In 74, 1974, reduced to 54 miles. And in 1983, he reduced it to a trillionth the diameter of a proton. And now it's absolutely nothing at all. It's reduced to nothing at all. They call this a singularity, all right? This is how it's evolved. Even the theory has evolved. Okay, Einstein commented on Lemaitre. He said, your math is correct, but your physics is abominable. Einstein was not impressed. I think it has something to do with the fact that his physics was abominable. Sir Fred Hoyle, he's an astronomer, cosmologist, and a mathematician in Cambridge University. He said on BBC Radio, you mean what? Like the Big Bang? What he was doing, he was taking the mickey, he was on radio, he was being interviewed, and he said, what? You mean like the Big Bang? He was mocking it. He was taking the mickey. And he coined the phrase, that's how it started. So the Big Bang is a Mickey-taking Mickey statement. It wasn't supposed to be a scientific statement. He was taking the Mickey. He was making fun of it on radio. And it stuck with this theory. That's how they come to the word Big Bang. This textbook says, after many billions of years, all the matter and energy will once again be packed into a small area. This area may be no larger than the period at the end of this sentence. Then another Big Bang will occur. A Big Bang may occur once every 80 to 100 billion years. How did he know that? How did he know that? Is this science or did he just believe it? How can you prove or disprove something like that? You might as well just make up something outrageous, make, make an idea which is even more outrageous, although you can't really, that's just outrageous as it gets. So, apparently everything started 
from absolutely nothing. Everything started from absolutely nothing. This textbook says nothing means nothing. Got it? Okay. From this state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. And just in case you guys are confused with, confused with the idea of nothingness, watch this. Discover magazine brought out this article in April 2002. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing, zero nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. How is that possible? Ask Alan Guth, his theory of inflation. It helps explain everything. So that's great. Alan Guth has got all the answers. Let's go and ask Alan Guth. What does he say? He says the observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region. That means a dot. It's then tempting to go on one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. You see, that's not really funny. If I said that the universe came from an intelligent creator, I'll be called religious. But he goes on and makes a statement like that. Where's the science in that statement? There is no science. So let's get this right. Nothing, absolutely nothing, created everything. So it seems to me that the Big Bang is like a spoiled brat who wants absolutely something for nothing. OK? Absolutely everything for nothing. So the Big Bang is nothing but a big spoiled brat. It is not scientific, and it's in science books. Okay, it's not scientific. Even more important than that, it breaks every single law of physics. It breaks, where did the energy from, come from? Where did the material come from? Where did the information come from? It breaks every single laws of physics. The first, I'm going to go through a couple of those. The first law of thermodynamics says this. Matter or energy cannot be created or destroyed. Okay, so if you take a piece of wood and you want to completely make it disappear, you couldn't. You couldn't make it disappear. What you can do is you can... Burn it, change it into smoke or ashes. You can't make it completely disappear into thin air, all right? And you cannot create something from thin air. You cannot create something from nothing. That's what the first law of thermodynamics says. You can't create anything, and you cannot destroy anything. Not completely. You can just transfer it, change it to something else. The law applies to energy, it applies to matter, and it applies to bills, okay? You can never get rid of bills. It's true, you can change it from unpaid to paid, but you can never get rid of it. You can also never create bills. Wouldn't you love to create bills and send them to your electricity company? Okay, the Big Bang also breaks the law of causality. Okay, causality is the principle that for every event, there is a cause. For example, if a tree collapses because of strong wind, okay, the event is the tree falling, and the cause is the strong wind, okay, the wind that's pu pushing it down. That's what it means. If you see a computer fly, the event is the computer flying, and the cause is most likely Microsoft Windows crashing again. <laughs> it's very, <laughs> you need to get this right. Look, if you have kids, and you tell your kids to do something, and they say why, and you tell them just because, you broke the law of causality. So don't tell them that. Tell them because you say so, okay? That works for me. Okay. So the six million dollar question is this. What caused the Big Bang? All right? Okay, we have the event, but what is the cause? And that question is still unanswered. The Big, the big Bang also breaks the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, this is the law that says everything tends to go from order to disorder. Scientists know all over the world that the universe is winding down. Now, if the universe is winding down, who wound it up? It must have started somewhere. Who wound it up if it's rounding down? Now, because of this law, we all have jobs. Yeah, jobs like painting roofs, fixing roads, fixing your car, fixing the roof of your house. Because of this law, we all have jobs. You know, we're fighting this law all the time. Now, no one goes to bed at night and wakes up looking better, except for my wife, of course. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, <laughs> so, that's true, right? Now, you, you have to spend hours trying to look good again. Okay, now look here, Sue, on this screen. No matter how hard she tries, she's going to look like this when she's 90. Okay? <laughs> and just when you think it cannot get worse, it does. No matter how hard you try, it, <laughs> keep looking young, you still get older. Okay? Now, that's a scientific fact. All right, that is a scientific analysis. Now, according to Isaac Asimov, 
All we have to do is nothing and everything deteriorates, collapses, breaks down, wears out, wears out, all by itself, and that is what the second law is all about. Okay, you need to understand this. So there is nothing you can do about this law. You cannot even break even. Okay, it's only going to get worse. So enjoy it while you can. Where did the laws come from? Here's the question. Where did the laws come from? Where did the matter come from? Where did gravity, centrifugal force, and so on? And the list is absolutely huge, okay? So where did these things come from? Big Bang does not answer those questions, and yet we use them as science book. It's a religious statement. Now, evolutionists know all this, but they've got an answer for it. Do you know what the answer is? The law did not exist at the moment of the Big Bang. Brilliant. Get rid of the law. Isn't that great? Oh, look, look, look. My, my the I've got a great theory, right? But all the laws in the physics get, goes against it. I'll just get rid of the law. It never occurs to them to get rid of the theory. Okay? But th that makes sense, right? Get rid of the theory if it doesn't work. Okay. Now, th the truth is, that's not funny. It really isn't. Because if I, as much as suggested that there was an intelligent creator behind it all, I would be called religious. And that is what's strange. That's hop, grasshopper, hop. Okay, the Big Bang is now in crisis. Now, if you don't believe me, go on the internet, type Big Bang crisis, and you'll see it. The internet doesn't lie, okay? It will tell you that it's in crisis, all right? The Big Bang is in crisis. This guy says, I have little hesitation in saying that a sickly pal now hangs over the Big Bang theory. Right, I'm going to just tell you a quick story here. As you know, I'm Lebanese. I've come from Lebanon, and we've got this thing where we use to insult people. And if you, if you want to insult somebody dumb in Lebanon, you tell them that they are a donkey, okay? But if they are really dumb and you really want to insult them, you tell them that you are not even a donkey, okay? That apparently is a greater insult. I don't know why, but if you go to somebody who's Lebanese and you tell them you're not even a donkey, you have given him the ultimate um, insult, okay? Now, it turns out that there is a statement, a scientific statement that also applies to uh, scientific theories that are very bad. You see, if a scientific theory is bad, they call it a bad theory. But if it's really bad, that it breaks every single law going, they say it's not even wrong. Okay, so they call it wrong when it's not right, and when it's really wrong, they say it's not even wrong. Now listen to this. This guy who came up with this is called Wolfgang Pulley. It goes like this. An apparently scientific argument is said to be not even wrong if it's based on assumptions that are known to be incorrect or alternately theories which cannot possibly be falsified or used to predict anything. So if a theory is based on assumptions and it's, uh, that, that are known to be incorrect or it cannot be falsified because there is no test you can run on it, you cannot predict anything with it and it breaks every single law going, then it's known as not even wrong. Okay? So. Believe it or not, the Big Bang is now referred to as not even wrong. So, why do they even teach it? Okay, so let's look at the Big Bang so far. So, the Big Bang so far is not even wrong and is a big spoiled brat. All right, so, he, this, this guy says, cosmology, cosmic as evolution, is not even astrophysics. All the principal assumptions in this field are unverified or unverifiable in the laboratory. Basically, you cannot test the Big Bang or any of its claims. So, you don't know if it's true or not. Is that science? In the recent paper, the same guy said, because the universe offers no control experiment, i.e. with no independent checks, it is bound to be highly ambiguous and degenerate. And that, that means substandard. Okay, what does that tell us then? It tells us that the Big Bang, Big Bang is not just untrue, it is actually a bad theory. Okay, it's a bad theory. Is this what the Bible is competing with? Is this what it's saying? Now, I wonder, um, you know what? I, I, I believe that I know how it all started, and I can cover it in 10 words, okay? And here it is. The big ba the, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Who's counting? 10 words. Did anybody count that? 10 words that explains everything. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, this is the very first sentence in the first book of the Bible that tells you how it all happened. You see, let me explain this to you. In the beginning, that's time. God created the heaven, that's space, and then the earth, that's matter. 
You see, God created time, space, and matter right there in the first verse of the Bible. And you see, something amazing happened. Each one of those has got three attributes created by the God of Trinity. So this is the Trinity of Trinity taking place right before your eyes. For example, time is past, present, and future. Uh, we got space, which is length, length, width, and depth. And then we got matter, which is solid, liquid, and gas. And you see, God created all of those things at once because if he hadn't, if he created matter without space, where would he put it? If he created matter without time, when will he put it? So God created all of those things, and he created the law at the same time so that they could exist at the same time. Now, to me, that sounds like a scientific statement, okay? So what's the bottom line here? Here are the facts. Cosmic evolution is not even wrong, all right? So scientifically, cosmic evolution, that is the Big Bang, could not have happened, therefore it didn't. So cosmic evolution is not science. Right, let's go and do the next one. The next one is shorter. Now we come to the chemical evolution, which is the origin of higher elements and hydrogen, from, from hydrogen. Basically, most of us should be familiar with this concept that we have chemicals elements on Earth. We all know this. Hopefully, you've all studied this. We have about 92 of those that are generated, um, that are done naturally, and we've got some more that happens through decay, and some others that are made synthetically by, by man, man-made uh, chemicals. So, they put them all together, around about 118, and they put it on a table called the periodic table. All right? It's very clever stuff. All right, here we go. Now, you should have learned at school that um, this is how it works. If you want to make water, for example, you take two hydrogen and you take one oxygen element and you fuse them together and you create this molecule or a compound we call water. And that's how it works. So from those elements, you can create more or less, well, you create everything that you see around us. And that's it. That's as simple as that. Well, evolutionists will want you to believe that everything started with the Big Bang. Again, everything started with hydrogen and helium and all the rest came from those two. That's how it's supposed to have come. All magically evolved. All right? Now, this guy says the Big Bang is presumed to have produced just hydrogen and helium, only two of the 92 elements of the Earth's crust. So we start with two things, and we end up with 92 or more. That's, that's the theory. That's the idea with this. Well, how could that happen? Okay, so evolutionists would, um, would say that this can happen through something called fusion. All right? This is when two or more atoms get together, they, get few, they, they cause through heat and energy, and they create, um, which is created through a star. So you create fusion within a star, you put more elements together, and you create something new. That's the idea anyway. So here's the interesting thing. Using fusion, and this is a well-known fact, using, using a fusion, you can't get past iron. Iron is element number 26, okay, so it works from top to bottom. That is not even halfway. Okay, it's one-third of the way. And the, you know what happens? Basically, it doesn't get halfway because it cannot get past iron. You see, the rest of this, there are things like silver, lead, and gold, you know? Obviously, they're all overpriced and we don't want them anyway. But the truth is, they are there, where they do exist, so where did they come from? The whole idea is that the, the star uh, gets so hot when it gets to iron, it gets so hot by the time it gets to the process of iron fusion that it implodes and it explodes again. And that's a known fact. It's an absolute known fact. This guy says, a star will undergo core collapse before achieving fusion of the heavier elements. So according to this guy, stars cannot produce the rest of the elements. So where did the rest of the elements come from? This picture will show you the stages of the fusion that can take place. This is common knowledge. If you go on the internet right now, you will see this. It's, normal. it's known fact. Everybody would know this if they were to check it out. This is what they tell you. You find this on the Wikipedia, this very picture. And it says, this is how it goes. It says it starts from hydrogen to helium to carbon to neon to oxygen to silicon to iron, and then it collapses. That's it. So where's the rest? Evolutionists know that this business of fusion doesn't go any further, but does it stop them from believing in it? No. That's because it's not science. It's faith. Okay, it's a belief, it's hop, grasshopper, hop. So where did it come from? Well, I have a theory. I think it came from an intelligent creator. Now, is that being religious? Well, there is no intelligence in denying facts, right? So here's the bottom line. The chemical evolution could not, is not even wrong. It couldn't have evolved, therefore it didn't. Therefore, chemical evolution is not science. So why do we teach our kids this? 
We're going to come to stars now, and after this, we're going to have a break. Uh, how are we doing for time? Okay, right, okay. Okay, now we come to stars. How did it evolve? This is called stellar evolution, all right? Let's have a quick look. This article uh, in Science and Space magazine says that there are 76 trillion stars in the universe. That's seven followed by 22 zeros. That's a big, big number. And it says that there are 10 times as many stars as grains of sand on all the world's beaches and deserts. Please try to imagine this. All the sands and grains, the grains of sands across the whole world and all the beaches, there are more stars than that. Okay, 10 times. There are 10 times more stars than that. That's a lot, right? And that's not all. This part says that's only the stars that we can actually see and know about. Apparently, they don't know about the ones they don't know about. Now, there are 70 sextillion stars. Okay, now the population as of January was six. 0.5 billion people. That means each one of us, if you work this out, can own 10 trillion stars for yourself. Okay? So if you want some stars, get out there and get them. You can have 10 trillion. To give you an understanding of this concept, and this is how it works. Apparently, somebody's worked out that if a child, the moment they can start counting, they start counting as fast as they can and never stop counting until they die, which, I don't know, 80, 90, 100 years old, they will never reach one billion. If you don't believe me, try it. But the truth is, that's a big number. One billion is a big number. It's saying you can own 10 trillion. That's 10,000 billion for yourself. Each person can own that. That's how many stars there are out there. Here's another interesting fa fact. If there are 76 trillion stars, and the universe is supposed to be 20 billion years old, and listen, I'm being generous here. They say in textbooks about 14.7. I'm being very generous to them. I'm giving them even more time. 20 billion years old. There should be over 6.5 million stars forming not every year, not every month, but every minute. We should see every minute six and a half million stars forming before our very eyes. Otherwise, we cannot have all the stars we have around us, okay? Otherwise, it doesn't happen. Remember, it's supposed to have Big Bang and all the stars have, been, have come to place. If we don't see six and a half million forming every minute, then they couldn't have it arrived. They, we can't see it. We shouldn't be there. So how many do we see happening today? How many stars do we see evolving today before our very eyes? None. We see none. Okay, they've got telescopes that can go back and back in time. They can see very far. They can see amazing facts and, and long distance stars. How many stars do they see using the best telescope they've got? None. They see none. And of course, you'll get the evolution and say, whoa, 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 whoa. We see one forming right now in Crab Nebula. One, okay? But it turns out all it is is an area with that's dust that's clearing and there could be a star behind it that's shining through. That's all they have. Of course, one guy would say, Wait a minute, it's quite easy. All you've got to do, right, if 20 stars explode next to each other, that creates enough energy and squeezes the gas in such a way you get one star. Brilliant. You, get, you lose 20 stars to gain one. Okay? That's the dumbest idea ever. And we've never seen it happen. And why can't these guys get a job with the government so that they can get us out of recession using logic like that? Anyway, it's purely theoretical that 20 stars can produce one. It's purely theoretical. We've never seen it. And that's one real good way of losing stars, not gaining them. If you have to lose 20 to gain one, you're going to start losing them. Okay? That's not how you gain new stars. Okay? It's illogical. It doesn't make sense. It's also interesting that stars sometimes blow up for no, well, they run out of fuel or whatever, and they just blow up. Okay? And they call this nova. Now, if a big star blows up, they call it the supernova. It seems like every 30 years or so, a star explodes and causes the supernova, and all we will see is the remnant of the ring that goes around it, okay? Now, after searching the heavens for all possible novas and supernovas, all they can find is 300. Now, a universe that's supposedly billions of years old should have more than around 300 supernovas, right? Do you agree with that? That doesn't tell me the universe is old. That tells me the universe is young. One day I'll have to come back and tell you, show you evidence of what we have that proves the universe, the earth, and life is young, uh, uh, very young in comparison to evolution, around about the 6,000 years period. I'd love to come back and do that one day. This guy admits, the silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is that we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. Here's an admission. 
Despite that, let's see what the British curriculum say we should teach our kids. Okay, our single and double science key stage, that single and double, I'm only showing you the single there, but both of them do the same. It says pupils should be taught how stars evolve for over a long time scales. That's what it says we should teach them. Okay, so what if they don't evolve? What do they teach them then? Do they still have to teach them? So what's the bottom line? St stellar evolution is not even wrong, okay? We've never seen it happen. We've never seen it happen. Therefore, it's not science. Because we've never seen it happen, okay? We should see it happen if it happens. All right, so stellar evolution is not science. Right, well, I don't know how long we took so far. How are we, uh, this is a good place to have a break. I hope you enjoyed the talk so far. If you have any questions, we're gonna do the second part. We're gonna go through the remaining three meanings of evolution. So far we did chemical evolution, uh, cosmic, chemical, and stellar evolution. Next, we're gonna talk about organic, macro, and micro evolution. Uh, if you have any questions in the meantime, please put that in that box that Andrew was talking about. Do you wanna come in front? Yeah, brilliant, thank you, John. We'll have it halfway around the floor. I don't know. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Am I coming through? Okay. How about I scream? Okay. That's good. Okay, I'll be quiet. No, don't do that. All right. Okay, organic evolution is the one we're going to cover right now. Organic evolution is how life supposedly has started spontaneously from non-life by accident without intelligence. Okay? Now, the fact is we can't even create life on purpose with intelligence as it stands right now. Okay, here we go. Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, by theory, my theory would absolutely break down. Darwin wrote this in 1859. He didn't know the structure of a cell. It was unknown at that time, okay? They didn't know how it was like, and Darwin was hoping that it was no, com more, no more complicated than a simple little jelly, all right? That was his hope. So let's see how life started according to the books we have today. Right, this one says, 4.6 billion years ago, Earth cooled down and formed a rocky crust. This one says the planet cooled and a rocky surface was created. This is what our kids are being taught, okay? And then it continues saying Earth's surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Oceans formed as it rained on the rocks for millions of years. This textbook says millions of years of torrential rains created great oceans. Okay, this is what our kids are being taught. And then this same book continues saying, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemical. And it goes on to say, progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. I agree with that. It's so slow, it hasn't happened yet. Okay? <laughs> we have never seen it, and it hasn't happened. Okay. No, I, have, I do have a lot of debates on the internet about the subject of or organic evolution. And... Um, Evolutionists like to mock creationists, and they say, you creationists are so dumb, you believe in, say, 6,000 years old universe. And I tend to remind them that they believe we came from a rock, okay? So they say, no, we don't, and usually I respond like this, and we can make a note of this, I can send you a copy of this if you like, and this has come straight from textbooks to help them understand, bless them. I, wrote, I write back something like this, 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down, in brackets, from a rock, and formed a rocky crust from rock. Earth's surface was hot, that's rock, and there were large pools of bubbling lava from melted rock. Oceans formed as it rained on the rocks, rock, for millions of years, swirling in the waters of the oceans and bubbling broth of complex chemical soup to a living organism, all from rock. Normally when I put a comment like that, that would be the end of the conversation. I don't normally get replies. It, uh, I don't know what happens to them. They obviously get a shock. Okay, so let's find out what life really looks like. Was Darwin right? Are our textbooks right? Let's have a look. Okay, well, it turns out that a simple cell, that's a single-celled organism like paramecium, is more complex than a space shuttle. Okay, now that's not simple, Charlie. A person has over 50 trillion cells, okay? Each cell is more compli complicated than a fully functioning city. Each human cell has a complete database 
okay, that in the center of it holding every single bit of information about the human body. And this is called DNA, all right? This is a, which stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, that's a mouthful. Right, now that doesn't look like a jelly, does it? Okay, that's a close view for you. DNA is made of chromosomes, okay, made of little things called chromosomes, and we have 46 of those, and we call them DNA. All right, these are the facts. We have 10 fingers because our DNA says so. Okay, we have two arms, two legs because our DNA says so. The DNA is a complete pro a, a storage system that keeps note of every, how we're made up, our structure, our entire structure, like the ear, our digestive system, the eyes, the nose, how we breathe. Every th single part of our body is made up because our DNA says so. That's how they both put together. It's one super massive database. Okay, the DNA is spread across 46 chromosomes. You get 23 from each one of your parents. Okay, 23 comes from each one, put them together, you get 46. Now, if we have evolved, then clearly we would start with less chromosomes, wouldn't we? And as we become more complex, you get more chromosomes into your DNA. That would be the thinking behind it, right? And that's what evolutionists would want you to believe, that we started simple and became more complicated. Well, if that's the case, have a look at this. We as humans have got 46 chromosomes. Obviously, before we evolved into humans, we must have been a bat because that has 44 chromosomes. And before that, you were a wheat. And before that, you were a soybean. Okay? Now, obviously, if you believe in evolution, then clearly you would then evolve into having more, compl more chromosomes into your DNA, so you can look forward to becoming a tobacco <laughs> with 46, 48 chromosomes, and of course into a chimp and an amoeba. Okay, here's an interesting fact. If all the chromosomes from one person was stretched out and laid end to end, it would stretch from here from Earth to the Moon and back 550,000 times. That is a lot of information in your body. That's where it is. The average human has over 50 trillion of those cells. Yet, if you put them all together, if you take all the DNA in your body and you put them together, it will just about fill two tablespoons. All right? That's an incredible fact. Okay, the DNA holds so much information that if it was typed out and filled in a book, it will fill the Grand Canyon 78 times, okay? If you typed out in the book, it will fill the Grand Canyon 78 times. That's a lot of information. Okay, to give you an appreciation, let's say how big is the Grand Canyon. The Grand Canyon is 277 miles long, 18 miles wide, and over a mile deep. That's a lot of space, and it fills that giant hole 78 times. Okay. Let's put things in perspective a little bit. As uh, the, a computer system, the power of a computer system is measured by its processing power and the capacity by which it stores information, how much information it stores. Well, as of May 2010, this is hot out of the press, if you want the most powerful supercomputer, you would want the Cray Jaguar computer, okay? This is the fastest supercomputer around. I know my son is gonna end up buying one of those. I'm sure, where is he? There you go. Okay, you've got one already. <laughs> <laughs> I'm selling them if you're interested. I'm not, I'm not. Okay. They had to invent new numbering systems to measure its power. Okay? So, you must be aware of terabytes. Are we all aware of terabytes so far? Everybody's aware of terabytes. Okay. Well, they had to go up to something else called petabytes. A petabyte is equal, one petabyte is equal to a thousand terabyte. Well, that wasn't enough. And by the way, one petabyte is the equivalent to the contents of all the academic libraries in America, all of them, just one, one petabyte. Okay, well, that wasn't enough, so they had to go up to an exabyte. An exabyte is a thousand petabyte. Okay, just in case you're interested, five exabytes is equal to all the words that was ever spoken by everyone who has ever lived. And that's five exabyte. Okay, well, exabyte wasn't enough, so they had to go up to yottabytes. Yottabyte is a thousand exabyte. Okay, well, then it wasn't enough, they had to go up to a zettabyte. A zettabyte is a thousand yottabytes. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but they sell them today. These are storage devices that they sell on the internet, and, and you can get those from a website called zettabytestorage.com. Okay, I don't get any commission for this, but I would like to if, uh, if this ever comes out. Okay, so you can hold that much information, and I don't know if you knew they existed or not. Uh, did you know, Peter, they existed? 
Again, you want to buy one of those? Okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Now let's move on to the next one. In August 2010, this is hot press, hot news. The Telegraph announced that in May 2010, the digital universe, that's the entire world's database, electronic data held by all the computers in the entire world, including mobile phones, internet, YouTube, Facebook, blogs, PCs, cameras, washing machine toasters, and memory sticks. Every single memory, if you put them together, it's expected to reach 1.2 zettabytes uh, of, of information. That's in 2010. That's a lot of information. This is the equivalent of, who's got an iPad? Just one person. And again, my son. Okay. If you've got an iPad, that's the equivalent of 75 billion iPads. That's equivalent storage. Okay, that's quite a lot. And in the next, apparently in the next 10 years, it's expected to grow 44 times larger. That is quite a lot of information. Okay, now get this. The DNA database is still more complex and still hold more information than all the computer programs ever written in the history of mankind. That is complicated, all right? Now, it gets more interesting. From the moment of conception until birth, a child will produce 15,000 cells in the, in the body per minute. 15,000 cells per minute. And each one of those cells is more complicated than a space shuttle. Fancy working for a factory that produces 15,000 space shuttles per minute. Okay? Fancy working for a factory that produces those and you are responsible for supply of material. Huh? You have to produce enough material to cover 15,000 space shuttles per minute. Okay? That's a lot. Okay? Right. What are the chances that this DNA could have put itself together by pure chance. Well, the estimate is one chance in 10 to the power of 119,000. That's 10 followed by 119,000 zeros. Now, I'm sure you just cannot comprehend how big that is, so I'm going to help you a little bit here. The universe is estimated to be 20 billion light years across, okay? From the, that's the universe that we can see. Okay, that's supposed to be, that's how far it's supposed to be. Right, that means if you were to travel at the speed of light, which is 186 mile, million miles per second, and you travel for 20 billion years, you will reach the, sp the distance that we can see at the moment, or at least the one we think uh, we can see. Okay, so it will be silly for us to measure this distance in something smaller like miles. Okay, that would make it a very large number so much, so large, that you can't comprehend. It would be even sillier to measure it in inches, wouldn't it? Well, let's do that. Now, if, the <laughs> if we measure the entire universe in inches, the distance will be 10 to the power of 28. Now, if I'd said it was 10 to the power of 29, that would have made it 10 times larger than 10 to the power of 28. If I'd said 10 to the power of 30, that would have been 10 times larger than that. Okay, so every time you add a zero, it's 10 times larger. Okay, well, let's get the DNA now. The DNA is 10 to the power of 119,000. Okay, that's serious. Okay, that is serious. Okay, it's, that's very large. Okay, let's, let's see if I can explain it in a different way. How many of you would like to win or find the winning lottery ticket in the street just randomly? Okay. I didn't even say it, you just said win, and your hand went straight up. I like that. Just say, I'm having some of that. I don't care, win, yes, I'm having some of that. Okay, how many of you would love to win or, or find at the winning lottery ticket in the street by ch pure chance? How many of you, with, okay, same. Um, <laughs> how many of you would like to win it every single week? Find it, if it's still you? Okay. How many of you would like to do this for a thousand years? Win, find the winning lottery ticket pure, by pure chance in the street every week for a thousand years. Well, if you were to do that, the chances of that happening would be 10 to the power of 65. Okay, that's 10 followed by 65 zeros. But the DNA, the chances of that happening by pure chance is one, it's 10 to the power of 119,000. Are we beginning to build a picture here? I don't think so. So, let's start with another one. 
Now, think of the whole universe and all the planets that exist everywhere. Think about the whole universe, okay? The, the universe is pretty large, and we've just heard that it's 76 trillion stars out there, okay? So that's a lot of stars, right? Well, I want you to think of the universe in terms of atoms. How many atoms could there be? Okay, that's quite a lot of atoms, all right? That's a huge number of atoms. You're never going to think of that, all right? You can create a universe if you're going to talk along the lines of how many stars versus atoms in a grain of sand. You will have as many atoms as there are stars in the universe, okay? So I'm thinking, you're thinking really small here. Imagine you're going to snatch one atom by pure chance and get it right. Okay, what are the chances of that happening? Well, the chances of that happening is 10 to the power of 80 of snatching one atom from a universe by pure chance and get it right. Well, DNA, by chance alone, would be 10 followed by the 119,000. Are we clear on this? Are we very clear? Do I have to keep going? No, right? Okay, I'll do, I will do, no, I'm kidding, I won't do anymore. Okay, this guy says, nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organize themselves into the first living cell. That means, you know what that means? It's guesswork. They don't know. They've just guessed it. All right, nobody knows. Nobody knows. Okay, this expert says, even with DNA sequence data, we have no direct access to the process of evolution, so objective reconstruction of the vanished past can be achieved only by creative imagination. Okay? So, what do you need to do this? You need imagination. Okay? So, how good are you with imagination? So, is this science? Is this based on evidence? It's imagination. Here's this textbook. It says, the history of life on Earth began spontaneously 3.5 billion years ago. How this occurred has been and will continue to be a topic of inquiry. Let me translate this to you. Okay? Read between the lines. It says, it's okay to inquire about how life evolved but not okay to inquire whether it involved. Okay? That's not allowed. This encyclopedia says, origin of species not addressed in 1859 and still a mystery in 1998. Both the origin of life and the origin of the major groups of animals remains unknown. Something tells me they're not sure how it all happened. Okay? That definitely is very clear. Now, if it didn't happen by accident, then how did it happen? This guy called Sir Frederick Hoyle, he said, the mathematical probability of life starting from inanimate matter is so high that it's enough to, bu to bury Darwin and the whole theory of evolution. There was no primeval soup, neither on this planet nor on any other, and if the beginnings of life were not random, they must, have, they must therefore have been the product of purposeful intelligence. In a nutshell, any other way is made up. Okay? There is absolutely no evidence to support this, and they still at it, organic evolution. Despite that, in December 2002, Natural Magazine said, life on Earth may have began in the, cr in the in crust on the ocean floor. More than four billion years ago, two biologists are proposing, the idea leaves many questions unanswered. So let get, let's get this straight. The, it may have began in rocks. Okay, can you read it there? Can you say it may have began in rocks? So is this science? May have and proposing? Is that science? I don't think so. It leaves many questions unanswered? Hmm, I think it does. So, what if the theory is wrong? Okay, when will we let go of it? When will it happen? Is this science? I thought science is something we can test and we can observe and we can demonstrate. All right? Hop, grasshopper, hop. Okay, the biology textbook says, the first living cell emerged between 4 billion and 3.8 billion years ago. There is no evidence of the event. There's no record of the event. Okay, is this confusing? Okay, is this saying we know it happened, but we have no proof, no evidence? Is this what it's saying? Okay, how do we know it happened then? Yeah, how do we know? It's just made up. That's the truth. And then on the next page, same book, it says the first self-replicating system must have emerged in the organic soup. So let's translate this. We will keep this theory even if we have no evidence, okay? Also watch out for the word, must have emerged. It all happened magically. If I said it happened magically, I'm told I'm religious, okay? That's, that's interesting, isn't it? So is that how it must have happened? Okay, let's have another look at our evolution chart now. 20 billion years ago, the Big Bang. 
4.6 billion years ago, the Earth foaming. Around about 3 billion years ago, life appears from a rock and found someone to marry. It's quite romantic, really. <laughs> I mean, it's what's going on. Okay. I wonder whether God saw all this nonsense ahead of time and he had anything to say about it and to warn us about it. Okay, let's have a look. All right. In Jeremiah 2.27 it says, You say to a stock, you are my father, and to a stone you give birth to me. Ah, the Bible, scientifically accurate again. Even predicting what some religions were going to come up with. Okay, how amazing. Next. So what is the bottom line? Well, ev organic evolution is not even wrong, is it? It's not even wrong. All right. So it couldn't have started by chance. Therefore, it didn't. All right, to say anything else, well, organic evolution is not science. Okay, we're going to look at macroevolution. This is a fancy word that evolutionists use to describe how one kind of animal can change from completely one type to completely another. Macroevolution, evolution, M-A-C-R-O. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of the concept of a dog can produce a cat, a flower or a banana can make a donkey. All right, that is the idea of what macroevolution is. So when you're talking about evolution, it's very important you know what they're talking about. And most of the time, that's what they're trying to sell you. That's the idea they're trying to sell you. So let's see, first of all, what Darwin said about what he thinks the theory is all about. If my theory were true about slow, gradual changes, numberless intermediate varieties must assuredly have existed. So if he's right, we'll see plenty of evidence everywhere. Well, that's a fair comment, isn't it? The guy comes up with a theory, give him some space, he comes up with a theory and he says, if I'm right, you'll find this. And if you don't find it, what do you do? You let go, all right? Unless it's a religion. Okay, let's see what the book says about this. Since Darwin, many links have been found. Okay, interesting. Apparently, we have many links. Well, that's pretty promising, okay? So that's good. Well, let's see what our curriculum, the British curriculum says we should teach our kids. The British single and double. Keys, science key stage four. Okay, I'm showing you just a single, but it is both of them, single and double. I've got copies I can send you if you want. It says, the fossil record is evidence for evolution. It makes me laugh when I read those, it really does. Okay, students surely are forgiven if they thought there is now evidence. Well, if the curriculum is saying it, surely they wouldn't lie. Okay, well, let's see if this is right. Dr. Belinsky, who teaches in many universities, this is a very famous guy. He's, he's written many books, he's really clever, um, and, and most of the time, all he's saying is saying, look, I'm not a Christian, I'm just going to tell you the way it is, all right? He, this, he's very fair and honest. There are gaps in the fossil graveyard, places where there should be an intermediate form, uh, should be intermediate forms, but where there is nothing whatsoever instead. No paleontologist writing in English, French, or German denies that this is so. It is simply a fact, Darwin's theory and the fossil record are in conflict. Hmm, so there's no evidence. That's interesting. Okay, well, what about what the curriculum said? Okay, what about what Darwin said? This science magazine said, in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions. In general, these have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard and some pure fantasy has crept into textbooks. Is this suggesting that we're now fantasizing that this theory is actually, we're fantasizing fossils. Is that what we're doing? It goes on to say, this is a guy called Stephen Jay Gould. He, this guy, Stephen Jay, Jay Gould, he's hardcore evolutionist, okay? This guy is a total evolutionist. He said, as Darwin noted in The Origin of Species, the abrupt emergence of arthro arthropods, arthropods, I knew I'd mess up on that one, and the fossil record during the Cambrian presents a problem for, evo for evolutionary biology. There are no obvious simpler or intermediate forms, either living or in the fossil record. That is a confession, okay? This evolutionist has written many books as well, yet the transition from spineless intubrates to the first backboned fishes is still shrouded in mystery, and many theories abound, shrouded in mystery. Mmm, makes me laugh. Okay, the encyclopedia says, both the origin of life and the origin of major groups of animals remain unknown. What are they teaching our kids? Are they teaching our kids lies? If these are facts and they're saying we've got nothing, why are they teaching our kids otherwise? Why is the curriculum saying what it's saying? Why are they still hanging up, hang up on this, on this theory? 
Okay? There is no fossil evidence. There is nothing at all. Okay, here we go. The question should be, can fossil ever be used as evidence for evolution? I, I want you to think about this, and I want you to use this when you're discussing it with people. This is very, very important. Let's just say, think about this. Let's just say you find some fossils in the dirt. Let's just say you do that. What do you know about this fossil? All you know is that it died. Okay, that's all you know about it. You don't even know where it died. Okay, it could have died somewhere and buried there. That's all you know. You don't know anything. You don't know if it had kids. And if, 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 you, if you sure don't know if it had different kids, okay? Different kids. Why should that fossil be able to produce something that animals today cannot produce, okay? And you don't know if it survived. If it had kids, how would you know that it survived? It may have not even survived. So let's imagine this, you're in the court of law and some evolutionist brings in some fossil and says, Your Honor, this fossil proves that these, this is our ancestor. Uh, well, any graduate lawyer, lawyer would be able to say, Your Honor, we don't know if this fossil is the ancestor of anyone. That's the truth, right? So fossil records never count. It never counts. So why are they teaching our kids this rubbish? Okay. Did you know that the British Museum here in England has got the largest fossil collection in the entire world? Okay, that's the British Museum here. But when a senior paleontologist was asked why he didn't show the missing links in his book, he said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. I will lay it on the line there is not one such fossil. There is no missing links, guy. In fact, the whole chain is missing. That is absolutely true. Stephen Jay Gould said, the absence of fossil evidence for intermediate stages has been a persistent and nagging problem for evolutionists, yet they are teaching that still, and it still exists in British museums. Okay, if you go to British museums today, this is what you see. I took those pictures myself. It says, our living relatives. That's right. It says, our closest living relatives, our fossil relatives. Different stands, different places. Subliminal messages all the way through. And according to Colin Patterson, who worked there, he said that no, there is no such fossil evidence. There is no fossil evidence at all. Yet they're selling it as a fact. You go there, it's a fact. Okay. How can this be true without any evidence whatsoever? How could it all be true? Okay, but you could be here today and you say, well, what is the big deal? I was never taught evolution in school. It was never told to me that it was as a fact. I've never been brainwashed. So what if they teach this? I don't think I was ever taught this. Well, we're going to examine this right now. How many of you have heard of cavemen? That's nearly everybody. Okay. In fact, I'll be surprised if everyone hasn't actually heard of cavemen. Okay, you've been told, all kids everywhere have told that we've came from ape-like creatures. That's where the caveman idea comes from. We've been told this in schools, museums, and listen to this, parks. Children go to parks to have fun. They've been told that we, have, we come from an ape-like creature. That's where we come from. We have all been brainwashed. We've all been told these rubbish. All right. So we've come from, um, apparently, ape-like creatures. Well, let's see if this is possible. Is there any evidence? Well, let's start with Nebraska man. Did you know with Nebraska man, all they found is one tooth? Okay, this is, this is <laughs> a guy called Harold Cook in 1992. Okay, so that's uh, pretty recent. Found the tooth in America um, and in a place called Nebraska, which borders Colorado. He said that it looked to him as if this tooth was halfway between an ape-like tooth and a human-like tooth. Well, I, he concluded from that that obviously it belonged to an animal that was halfway between the two. Okay? They built a whole skeleton around this. I mean, it is absolute, they built a whole skeleton around one tooth. How did they know to build a whole skeleton around one tooth? Okay? And they made the guy a wife. You've got to be really good to <laughs> you've got to be really good to make a wife from a tooth. <laughs> I mean, how good it now listen, look that picture, that picture, it they gave it a fancy name, by the way. They called it Hesperopithecus, uh, Harold Cookie and they put it in a museum. And this picture appeared in the Illustrated London News Times in 1922. Okay, they went on claiming that this is proof for evolution. 
they, they were mocking people. They're saying, how can you not believe in evolution now? Look, we've got proof. Okay, they went around doing this. They mocked people and all it was is a tooth. Okay, you might think that's funny. <laughs> but this is where it came from. It turned out that it came from a pig. The tooth belonged to a pig. It's a kind of peccary, okay, peccary, and it's still alive in South America, running around quite happily, all right? At that time, they aged this tooth six million years old. And you know why they did that? Because apparently they found it in a geologic column, a geologic layer, Placine, and that's how they aged it. These are the layers they made up. Well, they found it in one of those layers that made it six million years old, okay? So much for aging rocks, isn't it? Nebraska man, proof of evolution. Might as well put hop, grasshopper, hop right underneath that. Okay, we're going to look at the next one, which is Piltdown Man. Okay, Piltdown Man. This was found in 1912 by an amateur archaeologist called Charles Dawson and a French faithful Catholic priest who loved the evolution theory called Pierre de Chardin and a few other people, by the way, and, um, who were looking for evidence for evolution. This evolution theory now has been around for 50 years, and they're getting quite desperate. We need to find proof. We need to find proof. All right? So this guy, or these guys, took a human skull and a jawbone of an orangutan. Okay? They broke the hinges, filed down the teeth, they uh, treated the jaw with acid, and they put some chemicals, stained it a little bit, and went out and buried it in a gravel pit. That's right. They went out and buried it in the gravel pit. So a few days later, they went out fossil hunting as they normally would do. And guess what they found? They found proof for evolution. They planted it there themselves. Okay, this became known as a Piltdown man, man because they buried it in a place called Piltdown, okay, which is in Barkham, Manor, East Sussex, near London. That's the map if you ever want to go down there. And by the way, if you ever did go down there, there is a place where you can have apparently coffee and meals and stuff. Apparently it's a good place, but unlike what the name suggests, it's not free. Okay, but you can't miss it. That picture will help you find it. Okay, guess what? Soon after the fossil was found, this thing that they made up, this is what they did. They hit the headlines. Okay, Darwin's theory is proved true. That's what happened. Okay, and they kept this hoax going for 40 years. Here, listen. If you were going to school during those years and you were told that their evolution is true and there is the proof for it for 40 years, you would have been brainwashed during those times that evolution is true, right? Who would unbrainwash you after that when the hoax came out? No one. You would be remained with the idea that evolution is true even though they came up with the idea. Because they go around saying it's proof, it's proof, it's a fact, and they only base it on one fossil they made up. But they add all the other ingredients to it, making you think that they've got many proofs. But this is what they had during this time. It was placed in the British Museum, and the same guy submitted more fossils for them to put in the British Museum. So they kept it going. Oh, yeah, they were very good at this, okay? They were very, very good. Now, you see, the way it works is like this. Somebody finds a fossil in the ground. What they don't do is send them out for people to look at. What they do, they create a replica for it. They keep the original, send the replica for everybody to examine it. So what happened? The Piltdown Man was sent everywhere with their replicas. No one saw the original. And they did research papers on this, about 500. Hey, listen, 500 research papers cannot possibly be wrong, can it? Well, it turned out that it was a hoax. Because what happened is one guy thought, wait a minute, let's examine the original. Out of the blue, just like that, let's go and examine the original. So he took it under a microscope and he started checking it out and he said, whoa, somebody's filed down the teeth. And this doesn't match, and that doesn't match. And before you knew it, he turned around and he said, wait, 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 it's one big hoax. It wasn't true. So, later, they dated the fossil to be 800, that's a skull cap, it turned out only to be 800 years old, and the jaw bone was about 100 years old. Nothing to do with each other, and they were very recent, and it came from a, an orangutan, okay? Eventually, in 1953, they discovered that it was a hoax, so that's 1953, um, and this is where they originally got the idea that the brain must have expanded before language did. And they still carry it today. Oh, the brain expanded, and then we have got proof of it here. And that was Piltdown Man. It was just a hoax. Okay, we're going to move on to Neanderthal. I can't go through all the fossils. I'm just going to go through a few. You'll be pleased to hear. Okay, here's another one that's found in the books still today. It's called uh, Neanderthal Man because it was found in Neander Valley in Germany. 
It was named that because of a Christian guy who lived there. It was named after him called Joachim Neander. Okay, Joachim Neander was a Christian who actually composed some Christian songs we sing today in our churches. And the song here is, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. Do you sing that here, Andrew? Is that sung here? That's where it comes from. Satan doesn't like that, you see. So he had to go in there and cause some damage in the place where um, Joachim Neander lived. Okay, this is the valley it was found in. This is where they found some bones. In the same valley, they also found some human bones, by the way. Okay, now the reason they said that this is um, halfway man and halfway uh, ape is because his bent, back was bent over a little bit. Okay, and um, it, it, not bec I mean, it wasn't a missing link, it was just had a back that was bent over. So 50 years ago, they found out that it was bent over like that because of arthritis. The guy was diseased, he had an illness, it was bent over because of arthritis or rickets. He wasn't part human or, and part ape. A doctor called Cuozo spent a couple of decades of his life examining this very fossil, and this is what he's actually written about it. He said, you must understand that this skull really cries out disease. The teeth are badly decayed, and the bones of the vault of the skull are extremely thick. There are many features that testify of acromegaly, which is a chronic disease that causes uh, enlargement of bones, or excess secretion of growth hormone in adulthood. Neanderthal man was just fully human. That was sick. That's all it was. If you limit, yet it's still in our textbooks today. It's still in the British Museum today and still used as proof of evolution. It makes you laugh. It really does. Just purely deformed body. That's all it was. It was, it's a hope grasshopper hope situation. It turned out that the evolutionists are so desperate to find some proof, they use Neanderthal as a proof. Some key people, listen to this, some key people even today are lying about this, and, and I, this is what I need you to pay attention to now. Look at this. It's a news article that appeared on the 19th of February, 2005, in The Guardian, about a professor who for 30 years, listen to this, deliberately falsified all the skull dates to fit the theory. This professor, you wouldn't think this would happen these days, would you? This, uh, this professor named Reiner Proch von Zieten, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. If not, I apologize. It's just, um, this is just some part of his report. And please, if you want to see the full report, I can send you an email. Um, you can ask me later. I'll email it to you or we'll put it perhaps on the website. I'll give you a link. The link is right up there at the top. Okay, here's, I'm going to show you basically just, a, I'm going to read through a snippet of what this guy has done. All right? This appeared on the 19th of February, 2005. Yesterday, his university in Frankfurt announced the professor had been forced to retire because of numerous falsehoods and manipulations. According to experts, his deception, uh, deceptions may mean an entire trench of the history of man's development will have to be rewritten. Anthropology is going to have to completely revise its pictures of modern men say Thomas Turber, the archaeologist who discovered the hoax. Professor Proch's work appeared to prove that anatomically, modern humans and Neanderthals had coexisted and perhaps even had children together. This now appears to be rubbish. The scandal only came to light when Professor Proch's, Proch was caught trying to sell his entire department's entire chimpanzee skull collection to the United States. In an inquiry later established that he had also passed off fake fossils as real ones and plagiarized other scientists' work. His university inquiry was told that a crucial Hamburg skull frag fragment, which was be uh, believed to have come from the world's oldest German, a Neanderthal known as Hanhofer Sandman, was actually a mere 7,500 years old, according to Oxford University's radiocarbon dating unit. The unit established that other skull had been wrongly dated too. This is all recent stuff. Another um, another of the professor's sensational finds, that's Binshoff Spire woman, lived 1,300 BC and not 21,300 years ago, as he had claimed. While Paterborn Sandelman, he was dated 27,400, only died a couple of hundred years ago in 1750. He made those dates up. It's an embarrassment. This is recent. Professor Aldrich Brandt, who led the investigation into Professor Broch's activity, said yesterday, Professor Broch refused to meet us, but 
We had 10 sit, uh, sittings with 12 witnesses. Their stories about him were increasingly bizarre. After a while, it was hard to take it seriously. You had to laugh. It was just unbelievable. At the end of the day, what he did was incredible. In one case, he had claimed that a 50 million year old half ape called Atopis had been found in Switzerland, an archaeological sensation. In reality, the ape had been dug up in France, where several other examples had already been found. It was just a recent ape. It was a lie. So you would think something happened in the past wouldn't happen today. Yet despite that, despite having no evidence, why does it still appear in the British Museum, which says this? It says, there is now evidence that an early form of modern humans had evolved in Africa by about 100,000 years ago. They may have had, they ha may have been our ancestors. They may have been our ancestors. There's your scientific proof. They may have been. That's what it is. That's, 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 we're dealing with science here. This is ridiculous. We get that all the time with science. May have been, may have been, probably. Here's another one. Look at it on the left side here. Look at the statement on the left says, they were probably the first people to bury their dead. Oh, there probably were they. Well, there you go. What proof? What more proof do you want? Probably that's what they did. And that's what we are brainwashing our kids with. That's what they see when they go to the British Museum. Is that necessary? Is that what they went to see? Okay, that's called slanted journalism. It happens all the time. You're probably used to it. Okay. They, it's not unusual to use this seat to, to, to promote this, um, this theory because there is nothing else. Okay. Here's a famous evolutionist from Japan. He has been digging out archaeologists' finds and stunned people worldwide. You know what they call them? They refer to him as God's hands. Yes, that's right. The Guardian said, site after site, Fujimura discovered stoneware and relics that pushed back the limits of Japan known history. The researchers and his Stone Age finds drew international attention and rewrote textbooks. He rewrote textbooks. His finds rewrote textbooks. And it's in museum everywhere. It, it went everywhere. Everything he found went everywhere. It turned out to be a hoax, and this article appeared nearly in every newspaper in 2000 and 2001. It's recent. Here we go. The BBC showed these pictures of Fujimura. He was caught burying his own fossils in the ground. These are the pictures. The this crea that guy created so much publicity that everybody believed him since 1981. Look, a lot of people who went to school since 1981, and a lot of people have been told what he had found was all facts. Even Christians believed him. You, why do some Christians try to match the Bible with evolution? That's because people like that have been brainwashing our students for a long, long time. Okay, so who's going to unbrainwash them? Is there any fact? It, it's a fact. We're brainwashing our kids. Now, is there, do we have any proof? Okay, here we go. We're going to move on to the next one. Uh, it turned out, uh, it was, this turned out to be a, uh, sorry, going back to the same one. They called it, uh, sorry, I moved on to, um, my, my, there we go, I moved on to Java Man. I'm just going to briefly cover two more, a couple more, and we're going to be done. It was technically called, this is Java Man. We're going to just talk about Java Man very quickly. It was technically called Pithecanthropus erectus. It means erect ape man. That's what it means, okay? It was later called Homo erectus. Java Man was found in Indonesia in, 19, in 1891, and that's about 120 years ago, in 1891. How many skulls do you think they found for this? Do you think... Maybe they found 100, 100 Java man skulls, maybe 50. How about 10? How about one? Did they find one whole skeleton? How about did they find half a skeleton for Java man? Well, it turned out that all they found was one skull cap, one thigh bone, and two teeth. That's all they found. Now, here's the question. How did the British Museum down in London know that it looked like that? How did it, know like it look like that? It gets more interesting. Here, look at this. The thigh bone was found one year later, and it was 50 feet away from the skull cap, and they assumed it was the same individual. Dr. Dubois is the guy who discovered this uh, fossil, these bones, okay? And then he later found human skull skulls in the same place, but he hid them under his floorboards in his bedroom for 26 years. 
That's what he did. And before Dubois died, he confessed that he didn't find the missing link. He just thinks that it was probably a giant gibbon that he found, that he made that confession. It turned out that the thigh bones belonged to a human and the skull bone it belonged to an extinct um, ape -like, a gibbon, which is an ape-like creature. This appeared in every, nearly in every American museum. It appeared in another place called Leyden uh, Museum in 1980. That day in 1980, it was in the museum after it was discovered as a hoax for 50 years. It was kept in that museum for another 50 years. So nearly 100 years, for nearly 100 years, students were told that this fossil was actually the missing link. Tell me, what would happen if you were going to school during that time and you were told that evolution is true? Would they unbrainwash you to tell you that it was all a hoax? They wouldn't. They would love, love you to keep that going. Okay, it gets more interesting. This whole thing, um, let me just make sure I'm in the right slide. In fact, you know what? I found out that on the, on the internet, if you go on the website on Wikipedia, they still use this as evolution proof, even though it was discovered as a hoax. Uh, decades ago. Okay. Now, the other thing is, on the British Museum, it doesn't tell you it's a hoax. So when you go on their, on their website, it shows you this fossil as if it was a proof, no mention of the hoax anywhere. It gets better. Dubois was only, well, he was, Dubois, the guy who had this fossil, was actually a student of Ernst Haeckel. Ernst Haeckel himself was convicted of forgery. And I can give you the details later on. But who's Ernst Haeckel anyway? So let me take you through Ernst Haeckel very quickly. He was a German professor in a university in Jena. Okay? What was interesting is that Ernst Haeckel in 1874 was convicted himself of producing fake drawings of the embryo. In 1874, this is, you've got to remember this, this is very important. Ernst Haeckel said the turning point in his thinking was when he read Charles Darwin's book. Ernst Haeckel became such a devoted evolutionist that he would do anything to prove the theory. Okay, so he became very desperate and he fabricated some drawings in 1869. Okay, that's what he did. That's how long ago? 150 years ago. He faked some drawings. Let me show you. He basically took a human embryo and he changed them. Okay, he faked it, he changed them so that it makes it look like as if a fish and a pig and all other animals look the same when they go through development, okay? He presented this as evidence. He drew it himself. That's what he did. He was basically saying that we were going through some kind of a mini evolution inside, this, inside the womb as we were developing. So, because the theory goes that we went on from fish to amphibian to reptile to mammal. And they, he said, there you have it, I have proof. Now, if you compare that with the real photos, look at the top, that's the one he drew. Look at the bottom, that's the one that is the actual pictures. They don't look like each other. He single-handedly, nearly single-handedly converted all the Germans to believe in evolution using these fake drawings. Bearing in mind that he produced those fake drawings himself, he said, when we see that a certain, at a certain stage, the embryos of man and ape, the dog and rabbit, the pig and sheep, Though recognizable as higher vertebrates cannot be distinguished from each other, the fact can only be elucidated, that means made clear, by assuming a common parentage. Ernst Haeckel was being deceitful. Okay, five years later in 1874, six of his own professors in his own university convicted him, found out that he was being deceitful, and he was convicted. And do you know what he said about that? He said this, a small percentage of my embryonic drawings are forgeries those namely for which the observed material is so incomplete or insufficient as to fill in and reconstruct the missing links by hypothesis and comparative synthesis. So he's saying, yeah, I made that up. That's what he said, I made that up. And then he went on to say, I should feel utterly compelled, uh, condemned, sorry, where, were it not that hundreds of best observers and biologists lie under the same charge. He said, don't judge me. I'm not the only one doing it. They're all doing it. That was his defense. That comment is actually on the internet right now. He said, oh, come on now, be fair. Look, I mean, all right, I did it, but they all do it, okay? So leave me alone. So that was found 150 years ago. And it, here is the thing. Why is it still being used today? Okay, what's going on? Now, that's, that's the biggest mystery of ever, ever. It's still in our textbooks today. 
and our kids are still being taught this. You'll see in a minute. In this New Scientist article of St. George's Hospital Medical School in London, it said this, a set of 19th century drawings that still appear in reference books are badly misdrawn, says an embryologist in Britain, although Haeckel confessed to drawing them from memory and was convicted of fraud of the University of Vienna, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery, says Richardson. Yes, it is. This article appeared when, 1997. That's nearly 150 years ago. Okay, this book says, similar human and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. That was proven a lie 150 years ago. This biology book says, each embryo developed, develops a tail, buds that become limbs and pharyngeal pouches, which contain the gills, the, sorry, the gills of fish and amphibians. The tail remains in most adult vertebrates. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. Here's another book. The, I have so many, but I had to resist putting them all in. The human embryo possesses a tail, much like those of our close primate relatives. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. His, this book says, embryos all have gill slits, segmented backbone, C-shaped bodies, and tails. This shows that the organism must have come, uh, had a common ancestor. Please say it with me. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. Here's another book. Get ready. Gill slits and tails are found in fish, chicken, and pig, and human embryos. This was proven a lie 150 years ago. This is not science, right? Okay, this cannot be science. It's a religious statement that keeps saying again and again and again in order to brainwash you into this mentality that one way or another we have evolved. Well, listen, I don't mind if we have evolved. I, I'll be honest, I don't care. Well, I mean, obviously I care as a Christian because I know that it's not true. But it's not the fact, I'm not arguing with the theory. I'm arguing the fact that there is no evidence for it and it's still being taught as science. This is where my problem is. Put it in a religious classroom, I'm fine with that. And that's your theory. You can believe in whatever you like, but call, don't call it science and confuse our children. Here's the thing. Our students are being sent to school, and they're learning this stuff. It was proven a lie 150 years ago. Tell me, who's going to fight this fight and fix it? We're sending our kids unarmed to schools to learn this stuff and expecting them to fight it. Why are we expecting our children who are being taught in schools, they should be taught the truth in schools, to be taught a lie and expect them to fight it. Why can't the grown-ups fight this one? Why are, we lying to, why are we letting our kids into a battle like that where they're being brainwashed with lies, proven 150 years ago? Okay, if you want some more information about this particular subject, there is a book called Icons of Evolution. Uh, we're, we're building up a website called um, creationscience.co.uk where you're gonna, we're going to have a shop in there, where you can an online shop where you can buy those kind of books that you can see pop up every now and then. Uh, it's not ready yet, but if you get this book, it tells you from a scientific point of view how we don't have gills, we don't have tails, and it builds on this information a little bit more. Now, here's the thing. If all these lies were taken out of the textbooks, all the books, museums, parks, TV, if they were all taken out, did you know there is absolutely nothing to support the theory of evolution? There's absolutely nothing. If you just take them out, take out the lies. I'm not telling them to take out the theory. Keep the theory going. You're happy with it. Makes you happy. Have it. Take out the lies. It's, not, it's fair, right? Okay? If you, if you told me today that the moon is made out of cheese, it's fine if you want to believe in that, but don't tell me they went and brought back some cheese, okay? That would be a lie, okay? So don't do, let's not do that. Let's just take out all the lies. And if you did that, there will be nothing left. Okay, here's one called Orsman. It's very brief. It was found in southern Spanish town of Ors, or Orthe, if you're very posh, and I'm not. This is 1982, okay? It was claimed that it was the oldest fossil human remains ever found in Europe. All they found is one fragment of one skull, okay? Not even a full skull. It's a fragment of one skull. Can you see the picture up there? Our trusted archaeologist uh, said that this belonged to a 17-year-old man and who lived 900,000 to 1.6 million years ago. So the archaeologist stated this. He said it belonged to a 17-year-old man and lived between 900,000 and 1.6. They got so excited about this, right? You got to hear this. They were going to throw a whole big party. Okay, so they got together, they're going to throw a big party, and just about before they did it, they discovered that it came from a donkey. Uh, 
I don't, I don't mean the archaeologist. Okay, this was a real donkey. Okay, and it was from a four-month-old donkey. Okay. Hope grasshopper hope, right? Okay. <laughs> they still refuse to accept this as a hoax or a misunderstanding on a fossil. They still use it as a proof, even today, as a missing link. Here's a Peking man. He was found in 1920 in China in a place called Peking, in a cave. It was found with, it, a cave was found with crushed skulls, all right? And in this crushed, in this cave, they also found some tools. So they said, wow, there we go. We found it, the missing link. This is where humans have begun to learn how to use tools. Think about it. They found to use tools and they're practicing on their heads. I mean, they found crushed skulls. It turned out that the crushed skulls um, belonged to monkeys. And they didn't tell anyone that they found 10 normal human remains in the same cave. All that it was happening is that there were some people at tho in those days that liked to eat monkey brain. There are some cultures that do it today. That's all it was. They were crushing monkey brain skulls with a tool to eat it. No big deal. Oh, that's Peking Man, and there's your missing link. Okay, it looks like the only missing thing with these scientists is what's between their ears. That's definitely missing there. Some professor goes around digging into the ground, finding some fossils, and putting it into textbooks and calling it a missing link. That's not science. My dog does that, okay? Just, <laughs> you can't get fossils out of the ground and put it in a book. We, my dog would be very famous. You see, <laughs> you can't take fossils from random places, put them together, and say these are missing links. You can't do it. You can't even do it with fossils that actually are identical. You can't do that. This annual review of ecology and systematics says there are not enough fossils records to answer when, where, and how Homo sapiens, that's intelligent human beings, by the way, emerged. No one knows what really happened. Okay? They don't have a clue. They don't have a clue. Don't let them fool you. Okay, this one says, fossil evidence of human evolutionary history in frag is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. There are no evidence out there. Don't let them fool you in thinking there is any evidence. There is none. All they're doing, they've got this theory in their head, and they want to go and find something to fit the theory. They're not trying to find the answer. They're trying to find something that fits the theory. And if you want to do that, you can just about prove anything. I can prove stuff with people here. You can prove anything if you wanted to. If you really set your mind, that's not how it works. The evidence should lead to the theory and not the other way around. Okay, so what's the bottom line? Bottom line is that macroevolution is not even wrong, okay? If we don't see it happen, if it doesn't happen, then it doesn't happen, all right? So macroevolution is not science. Don't let them fool you. Now we come to microevolution. This is basically a variety, a variation within a kind. This is going to be very, very quick. The only part, this is the only part of evolution that is science, and it's true. The evolutionist will use this part where you have a variety, uh, a variation within one kind to sell you the idea that you can also get other, the, ver the change that can occur from one kind of animal to another. That's what they're trying to do. I don't have enough time to get into this one. Um, so basically, just because you can get a variety of dogs, it doesn't mean that that dog can become something else. That's just plain silly. Okay, there is a limit to what the dog can change to, and that's a dog. All right, it cannot change to any other kind of animal. And that is an absolute fact. In Genesis, it says, in chapter 1, if you read it, it tells you 10 times that everything brings after their kind. Everything brings after their kind. A dog will bring after dog. Cat, after its kind. Every animal will bring after its kind. A dog cannot produce a cat. A bird cannot produce a horse. A human cannot produce a donkey. Although sometimes that's debatable. Okay, so microevolution is science. Christians have thought of it first. It really does happen. But the problem here is that they're trying to sell you the other ideas of evolution. That's why it's very important you know what it means. If you know the meaning of evolution and you're discussing it with someone, ask them what do you understand it to mean. If they mean, well, a variety, a variation within the kind, then that's fine. We're okay with that. That's science. But if they say anything else, then it's not science. And you've got to know what they're trying to tell you and what they're trying to sell you. Okay, so every other meaning of evolution is just religious. 
This one is not. Right. I think we're at the end now. So why I can't believe in evolution, these are the reasons why. First of all, is lack of scientific evidence. There is a lack of scientific evidence. There's over 50 lies that supports this theory. There is no proof whatsoever. There is no, it's not real science. There are no fossil records. There is no billions of years. There's no geologic columns, okay? None of those exist. I don't believe in it because it's also la because of lack of logic, okay? You can't just bring some incompleted fossil and line them up whichever way you like and say these are the links. You can't even do it if they look similar. Never mind if they look different. You can't just do that. That's not how it works. That's illogical. And I don't believe in it because of lack of purpose. If evolution is true, then life has no meaning. Okay? Life means nothing. You can't tell right from wrong. We can't even tell right from wrong if evolution is true. It becomes a subjective um, um, principle. It depends who you ask. Right and wrong will be dependent on the person you're asking. It, to, in order for you to know true right from wrong, it has to be objective. Only someone like God can give you true right and wrong, uh, ups, uh, absolute rights and wrongs. If evolution is true, there is no morals, and there is certainly no hope of afterlife. So, I hope you enjoyed <laughs> this talk. There are so many things I couldn't cover. I'm going to just tell you very quickly. I didn't cover all the lies of evolution. There's so much more in the lies. I didn't cover the principle of geology. I didn't talk about radiometric dating. I didn't talk about dinosaurs, mutations, DNA, vestigial organs, bird evolution, horse evolution, and, ev and finally, evidence of young Earth. These are all subjects that could have been covered, but I think I probably need a whole week to do it all. Mm. But hopefully, if you enjoyed this, I can come back one day and maybe cover some of those subjects. But I hope you enjoyed this. And if there are any questions, please don't forget to put them in the box. I'll be happy to answer them. If it wasn't for being late, much later than I expected, I could have done them tonight. So God bless you. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Andrew.